So if I were going to talk about the atheist delusion, that's what I would suggest is the delusion, that, that, that an atheist can use terminology that is drawn from a world that is external to atheism for itself. And again, that's not an argument for God even. That's just an argument against atheism. Hola a todos, bienvenidos a este espacio. Mi nombre es Cristian Jiménez. En esta ocasión les traemos un debate que he venido trabajando en las últimas semanas. Un debate intenso que muchos estábamos esperando entre Alex O'Connor y Ben Shapiro sobre una pregunta que ha entregado a la humanidad durante siglos. ¿Es la religión buena para la sociedad? ¿Pueden acaso los principios morales y éticos existir sin un fundamento religioso? ¿Es la biología evolutiva y la filosofía materialista suficientes para entender estos conceptos? Antes de arrancar, les invitamos a todos a compartir este canal, a suscribirse, a activar las notificaciones, de modo que el algoritmo de YouTube continúe promoviendo nuestro espacio. Sin más, acompáñenme a explorar esta primera parte. Is religion good for society? Can a society hold together if there are no underlying beliefs that everybody shares? And we're going to be exploring what both of you believe are the most important principles undergirding any civilization. What are the foundations of morality and ethics based on? So without further ado, let's let's start. I'm not going to go into backstory too much because most people will be aware of, of, of who you are. And there'll be a lot of uh, fanboys and girls out there watching. Um, but let's talk about something that, Ben, you have um, spoken on and, Alex, you have responded to. This idea of the atheist delusion. Ben, could you sort of concisely, if you can, um, talk about what you mean by the atheist delusion? Sure. So I should start off by saying I don't actually think that it's possible to prove the existence of God. I'm also not a believer that you can disprove the existence of God. I don't think that logical argumentation is going to get you there one way or another. And so I'm not going to try and do that with, with Alex today, because I think that if people would have been able to provide dispositive proofs, then people would believe them. And if people were able to provide dispositive proofs that God does not exist, then people would be more apt to believe those as well. The, what I think is a, an atheist delusion is that it is possible to live ideologically purely in a way that does not rely on fundamental faith principles. When I say faith principles, I'm not going to make the claim that those faith principles are direct from Sinai or that those faith principles require the New Testament, for example. I'm going to make the claim that there are a bunch of principles upon which we base ourselves that are external to what we know about nature and evolutionary biology, and that many of the things that Alex does in his daily life, for example, are going to be things that rely on principles that are external to a philosophy that would assume a lack of the supernatural, a lack of the, the extra natural. Um, so some of those principles, for example, are free will. So every day we get up, we believe, virtually all of us, whether we, whether we say we believe it or not, we actually act in ways that, that betray the idea that we believe that we have control over our own actions, at least to a certain extent, and that that control makes a difference in the world. And that's what gives us purpose. It's what allows us to wake up in the morning and, and make the decision to do what we believe is right or what we believe is wrong. That the principles of right and wrong are external to evolutionary biology. So both of these principles that I've mentioned already, free will, right and wrong, these come from a language that is external to the, the Darwinian language of evolutionary biology. If you're talking about free will, there is nothing in nature that suggests the ability to make a decision free of environment and genetics in combination in some sort. The same thing is true of right and wrong, the idea that there is a right and there is a moral wrong that we can reason our way to. Another principle that I think that you're obviously very big on, it's something that you rely on all the time, your entire podcast is, is based on the idea of reason. These ideas do not exist in the context of a purely materialist atheist universe. Now, I'm not going to make the claim that I can prove that it's God who's behind those things because one of the principles of faith belief is that I don't understand God. So for, for people who don't believe in God, that's, that's an easy way out, right? That's an easy way out for people like me because I say, well, I, I don't have to explain the relationship between God and free will because, frankly, I don't fully understand God. But that's not really the... the that's not really a, an open window. That's just part of, of pretty much all faith systems, is that if my mind were the mind of God, then I would either be God or God would not exist, one of the two things. So the, the idea that reason makes a difference in our lives, that we can reason our way to propositions, and that that's more than just saying a few magic words and that's setting off a few neurons in somebody else's brain in a naturalistic way, that there actually is principles of truth, another concept that comes from the extra natural world that these principles exist. So, so far I've mentioned free will, good, right and wrong, reason and truth, right? All things that we consider extremely key in our daily lives and that 
Alex considers key in, in what he does. It's, I assume, why you get up every morning, or at least why you feel you get up every morning. You know, wh- what, what, what gets you up to do your podcast? It's because you want to say things that you believe are reasonable, are going to convince people to act in a better way, or I assume not a worse way, that, that get people to, to change their lives in some way, in a self-motivated fashion that's not merely in a, a sort of Pavlovian response to circumstance and environment. So if I were going to talk about the atheist delusion, that's what I would suggest is the delusion, that, that, that an atheist can use terminology that is drawn from a world that is external to atheism for itself. And again, that's not an argument for God even. That's just an argument against atheism. Again, I think the, the arguments against God are, are, are fairly compelling, and I think the arguments against atheism are fairly compelling. This is one of the things that I've said to Sam Harris. Um, and I think that the difference is that most people who believe in God have expressed doubts, and a lot of people who are atheists tend to be more religious in this way than many of the people who are God believers. Well, well, something's certain. We don't do uh, cold opens or soft starts here on the big conversation. Alex? Well, I am glad to begin on a point of agreement with you, Ben, that yes, if there is no God, there is no free will. But I think that's because of the truth of, this, of, of the latter of those statements. That I suppose the biggest criticism that I made of you in a, in a video response that I made to the atheist delusion, and, and this show does seem to have an extraordinary capacity for putting me face to face with people that I've been talking smack about online. So <laughs> thanks again. By the way, I should say it's a great video and everybody should watch it if they haven't. Well, uh, I'll, I'm going to put that uh, put that in the description, I think, that, that glowing endorsement. Uh, the principal disagreement that I think I had with you, Ben, is that there was a subtle, or not so subtle, implication in my view that yes, uh, with no God, there's no free will. But somehow having God can solve this problem. I mean, you said a moment ago that you don't think you can establish God's existence through reason alone, but assuming that you do believe in the existence of free will, you think it's a real thing that you have. Yes. And simultaneously saying that if there is no God, then free will makes no sense. Yes. That does read to me like an argument for God's existence, such that in order to to, to either say that there is free will, in order to say that there is free will, one must believe in God. And, and that does strike me as well, I mean, an argument to, for God's existence. I mean, to, to slightly curve that or, or to, to kind of sand off the, the rough edges there, I would say that the argument I made is, not, is an argument for something extra natural. Sure. Now, you can call okay. that God or not um, God, but, but, the, but the, the thing that I'm making the argument for is that you cannot get from a materialist Darwinist universe to yes. free will. That is not possible. So I know that the way you solve that is that you say that there is no free will. That's right. And what I'm saying to you is... You don't act that way. I hear this all the time. People say, look, you may say there's no free will, but you don't act as though that's the case. I, I, I suppose that I'm just confused as to what it would look like for somebody to act as if they believed there was no free will. I mean, the very argument that there is no free will that I subscribe to, at least one of the various mm-hmm. forms that it takes, is a, a sort of Schopenhauerian view that you can do as you will, you just can't will what you will. And, and that you are essentially just a biological machine reacting to its uh, to, to its internal and evolutionary drives. That's what's happening. Now, call that nihilistic if you like. That's a separate question. But as to the question of how this would make one act, the idea that this might uh, cause us to sort of lay around in bed all day or something, the very mechanism that I think is responsible for eliminating the possibility of free will, that is, the drives that make people do what they do, like I say, do exactly that make people do what they do. They make them get out of bed in the morning. Why do you get out of bed and go and make your breakfast if there's no free will? So you go and get breakfast because there's no free will and something is driving you to do that that's outside of your control. For sure. So the, so to get back to the nihilism point, which you kind of put aside, so that, that means that this conversation is essentially worthless in any sort of real sense. I mean, effectively, we were driven here by evolutionary biology and environment to have this conversation. Everybody who's watching this is driven by evolutionary biology and, and environment to have a particular reaction to that thing and ever round the cycle goes. That seems like a very purposeless life. Maybe that's, maybe the, again, I'm drawing from a realm that is not evolutionarily, bio, biologically you know, connected. You know, the, the word purpose is, is really, teleology obviously has been taken out of the realm of science pretty thoroughly by, by atheists and by, by many people in the sciences, although I, I would argue that Again, most scientists speak in the realm of teleology literally all the time, and they're yes. borrowing language from the language of teleology, even when they're describing functions of particular body parts, right? The heart pumps blood in order to right. keep you alive, right? They're, they're constantly using language that's teleological in nature. Mm-hmm. Um, the, the real question that I have, and this, this is what goes to the question that you were asking at the beginning, before the, the sort of pre-question question, which was the good of religion to society, one of those goods is people believing that their free will matters and this mm-hmm. actually is a useful thing. So I believe that it is deeply important 
for people in society to believe that they have the capacity to change themselves and to make different decisions than what biology would drive them to do. So you say, well, it's biology that drives you to get out of bed in the morning, which is almost Calvinist in, in sort of the, the, mm. the way that it's described, right? It's like you're predestined to get out of bed in the morning, so thus you get out of bed in the morning. But the reality is that we are constantly making decisions as though those decisions make a difference in the universe. And what social science actually does tend to show is that when people believe that they have control over their own actions, that when they believe that they're, they're capable of changing the way that they live, they do make those changes with more alacrity and in better directions than if they don't believe that. If people tend to believe in a deterministic universe, they do act worse. So it may work, this is, this is gonna be sort of Straussian in its implications, but the, that may work for you, you're a very high IQ individual who can somehow reconcile the idea of living a very purposeful life with the idea that actually there's no purpose to anything. Mm -hmm. But for the vast majority of people, that is not actually how they live. And I would suggest that even in your daily life, you don't get out of bed in the morning thinking, man, my biology is driving me this morning to get on the bike, have a great day, the sun is shining, that's my biology doing this. And I don't think that, that most people who live purposeful lives, even if they believe that everything they're doing is predetermined by the world around them, by their own biology, I don't believe they actually feel that. They have to engage in what they themselves would, would term an illusion in order to feel a, a sense of purpose and meaning in their lives. Of course, but that's what the evolutionary process, in my view, in my worldview, I should say, has done so well, is provide precisely that illusion. I mean, it, it's not as that, I mean, you say, look, you don't get out of bed in the morning thinking, gosh, you know, look at my biological My neurons drive. are firing, yeah. <laughs> uh, of, of course not, because if I did, then the whole evolutionary purpose that this this illusion serves would fall away. I mean, you say that this is a fairly purposeless life and, and perhaps a, you know, the implication is that it's a bit of a depressing one. Uh, I, I didn't come here to inspire optimism in people. I just think it is in fact the case. By the way. <laughs> it is in fact the case that free will doesn't exist. And, and we may feel very uh, nihilistic towards that, but uh, as a wise man once said, facts don't care about your feelings. <laughs> and I will say that the argument against free will in my view is based upon something broader than just scientific analysis or empirical research. Rather, we can build an argument, I think, from, from a law of logic, the, uh, the proposition that, that P must either be true or false, and it can't be both, it can't be neither. It has to be one or the other. Now, this law of the excluded middle, one of the, one of the foundational precepts of, of, of philosophy, we can simply ask a question of any kind of mental activity, and, and this will be regardless of whether it's material or immaterial. That's what makes this a crucial argument and an important one, a pertinent one, is that you can ask of that, uh, of that mental activity, is it determined or is it not? That is, is it determined by anything else or is it completely undetermined by anything? If it's undetermined by anything, then it's random. And you're by definition not in control of that which is random. If it's determined by something, then it's either determined by something further inside your mind or inside your brain or indeed inside your soul, or it's determined by something external to your brain. If it's determined by something external to yourself, I should say yourself rather than your brain here to uh, rid this conversation of uh, any implicit materialism, exterior to yourself, if that's what's determining the action, then clearly you're not in ultimate control of that action. If it's something inside of yourself somewhere, then all you do is push the problem back and you ask the question again, is that thing determined or is it indetermined? So indetermined, it's random, determined, you keep going back until you either terminate in something outside of the self, something uh, or, or I suppose something undetermined and therefore therefore random, either of which you are completely out of control in. If you say that it terminates in something like a soul, people like to do this, they say, well, look, with a religious philosophy, we have the benefit in, of introducing a soul. That doesn't solve anything mm. because you still need to, it's not, a, it's not a matter of having to explain the mechanism by which the soul brings about actions. That may well be a mystery, but if it is the case that whatever it is that's doing that is either determined or it's not, and that if it's not, it's random and therefore out of your control. And that if it is, it ultimately terminates in something outside of yourself mm. or something random, and both of which are out of your control. Free will cannot exist. Well, and that, so so I would that, be that, argument does, that does argument, that, that argument does rely on the complete deconstruction of the self. Right? I mean, the, you're using the, the term self in, in this argument in, I think, a couple of different ways. You're saying something outside yourself, but then you're breaking down the self into a bunch of separate components as though the self is a computer. Right, so if, you, if you took the self and you broke it down into a machine and there, there's like the micro, there's the microchip and you've got the processor, you've got, you've got all these different parts of it. So it has to be coming from here or it has to be coming from here. But I think the very idea that we have of ourselves as selves is as a deciding being. And so the, the attempt to carve that down into, so which parts of the deciding being, that is an avoidance strategy. So I, I don't think that the argument quite holds. Well, if we I mean, can call the self just 
a, 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 deciding a deciding being, being, a deciding being. Then that sort of fundamental assumption that we make about the nature of the self, I don't think is going to be incompatible with atheism. How so? Uh, because we're talking about what the self is here. I mean, atheists believe in the self. Uh, everybody believes in the well, self. Well, no, that's not, I mean, that, that, that I, I find difficult to believe. Why, why would an atheist believe in the self? The self is a series of, of, of non-deciding mechanisms, as you've described. I see that your view of the self is, is an atheist view of the self, a, a, a meatball wandering through space, as I've put it somewhat colorfully, the, the sort of Spinoza idea that, that you're a stone that's been thrown, and, and you can comprehend that you've been thrown, but you're a stone that's been thrown, and that's just the way that it is. Why would there be in atheist philosophy such a thing as a deciding self? The deciding self, the deciding being, is external to the idea of an evolutionary cause, because, uh, it, 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 again, it, the, the very word deciding suggests uncaused decision-making, and you've just excluded it through your own philosophy. Uncaused decision making, I, I suppose, is a concept that I think is unintelligible, and and therefore, if there is if there is an unintelligibility of the self on atheism, I suppose the the thrust of the criticism that I made to essentially every point you made in that video, except for uh, the argument from motion, is that what you're saying to me, if it applies to atheism, I think simultaneously applies to theism as well. How so? An, an uncaused decision. I mean, what is the process by which a decision is made? Ah, it, but now you're, but now you're, you're falling into the, the same sort of argument that I excluded at the beginning, which was, I said that the beauty of religion is that there's a bunch of stuff I don't understand. Hmm. So I can't explain to you how the uncaused self makes decisions. Well, then I can't explain to you how the uncaused self exists on an atheist But you have framework. a burden and I don't. Meaning I, that, I, I don't mean, think that's the case. You, you do though. I mean, the, the, the simple fact is that you are the one who's claiming that a reasonable materialist universe is the cause of all. And so if that's the case, you do have to explain the mechanism in a way that I certainly do not. My entire philosophy rests on the, on the positing of an entire realm of things I don't understand in terms of their interaction with the world. Now, as I said at the very beginning, that leaves me a giant escape hatch. I'm not mm -hmm. gonna pretend that that's not yeah. a giant escape hatch. It, it acts in practice as a giant escape hatch. It also tends to act as a fundamental principle of faith, right? Again, in, in every moral realm, right? When we get to the problem of good and evil, right? One of the big questions is, well, how can God allow evil to, to take place in the world? And the fundamental religious answer, as it has been for thousands of years, is my mind is not God's, which is a giant escape hatch. It also happens to be true from a religious point of view. So if I may, that there are uh, two sort of escape hatches here. There are two appeals to mystery going on here. And it seems to me that what you're saying is something along the lines of uh, my appeal, my, my simple appeal to mystery here is disallowed in the way that you're allowed to appeal to this, yes. this this mystery because I'm the one making the claim. I think that in no, the- No, not because I'm the one making the claim, but because the- I'm the one with the burden. In the context of this sorry, discussion- Sorry, I'm, I'm missing the who is the you and the who's the, the I in yes. a sense, but yes. <laughs> I, I, see what, I see what you mean. I'm, I'm speaking for myself there. Sorry. Um, if in the context of this discussion, this this began, the, the subject, which I think is the first one you bring up in this video, free will. Here's this thing that I think exists, and on the basis of its existence, think entails the existence of a God, or, or at least points to the existence of a God. I shouldn't say entail. And then when I say that I don't think that the, the concept of free will is, is uh, intelligible, and you say, well, how is it intelligible on atheism? And I say, I'm not sure it is, but it's not on theism either. And you say, well, there's my escape hatch. I can appeal to mystery. I don't think the burden is on me there. I think you were the one who was making the claim that free will does exist, that there is this mysterious property mm, of the universe actually, that's that not, that's escapes not this, this that, so, determined or indetermined dichotomy. And then when I say that this is, uh, this, this is unintelligible to me and, and based on what I see to be fundamentally appeal to a law of logic, suddenly I'm the one making the claim. I'm the one with the so, burden who has to do the proving. No, the I, actual, I the actual that claim way. that I originally made, if you, if you recall, was a conditional claim. Mm -hmm. I did not claim free will exists, therefore God. I claimed if you believe free will exists, it cannot exist in a materialist universe. Now, mm. you say, okay, fine, it doesn't exist in a materialist universe, I don't believe in free will. Yes. That's fine, that's totally plausible, as I said right at the top here. Mm -hmm. I'm not gonna prove to you that God exists today. What I am gonna say is that the vast majority of people throughout nearly all of human history have believed there is a thing called a self, it is yes. a deciding self that makes these decisions. If you are a person who believes that, you're right. It can't exist in your world. So, I'm not saying that it does exist, maybe it doesn't, maybe you're right, maybe you're totally right, and all of this is just a series of chemical firings, that's quite plausible, that's fine. What I have said, and this is the argument that, that hasn't yet been rebutted, is the is the is that society does require an extraordinary number of people to believe that they are capable of making decisions for the good or for the bad, because mm. again, not everybody is you, not everybody is capable of waking up in the morning, putting one half of their brain on hold, the, the side that says, what I'm doing today doesn't matter, and we are all going to wind up in the cosmic nothingness of space anyway, and the sun's going to explode and eat the earth. 
most people don't function that way. Mm -hmm. And so a, a functional society, a society that actually works, relies on people actually believing that their fate is in their hands. And the way that people tend to understand that on a day-to-day -day level is, I get up in the morning and I make a decision whether I'm taking my kids yeah. to school today. I get up in the morning and I decide whether I'm giving charity today. I get up in the morning and I decide whether to go to a job today. Because the truth is that for, for a huge number of people, and I would say this is true for virtually, not virtually all, many, 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 I would say the majority of people, if they were informed since the time they were small that their decision-making process does not exist, there is no decision to be made, whatever's going to happen is going to happen. Those decisions have no moral weight in the universe because the universe has no moral weight. There is no way to create a functional society on the basis of these premises. There may be, there may be a platonic world where philosophers you know, can, can think about this in the gardens of their imagination and feel great about it. But that, that's not actually how society functions, not for children, not for teenagers, not for adults. Uh, just, to, just to close off this, this, this moment, that if people listening agree with me that free will in fact doesn't exist and simultaneously agree with you that free will is somehow necessary for the upkeep of civilization, then I would simply ask them to consider who's relying on the delusion here, you know? Yeah. And, and I don't mean that I, as no, an insult, I, but you I, see no, what I'm saying, right? I, I, I totally agree. And so from my argument, you would be, and from your argument, I would be. Yeah. Meaning, I, I think that you, that you are delusional, there's no free will, and you think I'm delusional in the sense that, that there is no free will, and yet I believe in it. Yeah. Something like that, yes. yeah. So for you, Alex, just before we go to the break then, because um, we're trying to break it down, we've got two insane minds here really kind of uh, grappling, and uh, I feel as I've won a prize in a competition just to be here sitting with you both. Um, to break it down for the viewers, Alex, would you say that free will is maybe if there is no such thing as free will, is it nevertheless a helpful fiction for people, a convenient narrative that we can cling to to sort of bat away despair? Precisely why it evolved, in yeah. my view. I, I, I think I totally understand that, but, the, but because it evolved so strongly, uh, I will say that we are all, if we are sort of delusory in our belief in free will. I mean, uh, you're quite right in saying that I, I act as if free will exists in the sense of not constantly being aware that it doesn't. I don't wake up and do those strange morning affirmations that you mentioned into the mirror about, you know, the, the sort of heat maybe, death of maybe, the universe. But, maybe you but should. But people, people, I think it is good to reflect on, on your mortality in that manner every once in a while. And it, and it does inspire some, some serious thought about whether you're really taking your philosophy seriously. But I will say that the, the mechanism is so useful and has been so successful in embedding itself into our psyche that we cannot shake it off. So I can convince, I, I, I can have conversations with people as I do regularly, talking about the existence of free will, and they come away saying, you know what, that's extraordinary, maybe you're right about this. And nothing about the way they live their lives changes, precisely because of the fact that the very argument I'm making relies on the assumption that we will still be driven by our drives. All I'm doing is identifying what's actually going on there, in my view, it doesn't actually change what happens or what the brain indeed does. So the, the utility argument for what you're saying about free will is that the main utility in, in you saying these things is for people not to believe you in the end. We are predetermined <laughs> to go to a break at this point. So um, we're going to continue this. Um